We're continuing in our study tonight. We have committed ourselves as a church to take the first six months of 2021 to study one gospel. That is the gospel of Mark. And uh, we kicked off the new year with a collection of talks entitled Changes, looking at Mark's gospel. And tonight we begin a new collection of talks from Mark's gospel. And we're going to be studying tonight in Mark chapter 4. And I've titled this collection, and I'm also going to title my sermon this tonight, if that's okay. We've titled this collection and my sermon, we've titled it Small Faith. Everyone say small faith. faith. Look at your neighbor, say neighbor. You need small faith. Look at your other neighbor, the one that you don't talk to at all yet tonight. I know you haven't said hi to that person yet. And say, say other neighbor. I have small faith. I'm trying to get you to talk to people in 2021. Small faith. And, you know, I really wanted to uh, title this collection that because it's really important to me that you understand that what you got is a lot. Say that out loud. Say, what I got got. is a whole lot. lot. I think when it comes to the topic of faith or the concept of faith, I've been around church most of my life, and what I've recognized is that many people, when it comes to this word faith, it's like they've got these other synonyms, or they've got this other set of words attached to it to describe their faith. It's words like suddenly. It's words like immediate or phenomenal or miraculous or or signs and wonders or, or mystical or supernatural and I like all those words. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, some of y'all don't know about your boy, but I, I grew up in charismania. I am four generations deep Pentecostal. I love my heritage. I love where I come from. Um, I just, it's, it's who I am. So I, I believe the whole Bible, all the crazy stuff, all the weird stuff. I wonder what he believes. I believe it all, okay? Um, <laughs> I grew up going to healing crusades. I remember one time I was at this healing crusade with my mom and some of you are like, I'm losing you as I'm speaking. Others you are like, this is why I come to this church. I've been waiting for this night. Um, but, but, you know, I used to go to these healing crusades and like the preacher would line all the people. Have you ever seen this before? They'd line them all up and then they would you know, lay their hands on them and they would pray for them and then they would go down, you know? And so it wouldn't just be one row of people. They'd have to get another row of people, which were called the catchers, to catch the people who fell over. It's a whole system and a process. And I used to go as a young man like, oh my God. That's awesome. And I remember I left the meeting one time. I said, Mom, I said, yo, what happens if that preacher prays for himself? And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, he's going to drop to the ground. There ain't going to be nobody there to catch him. I I was mesmerized by the power of the Spirit. I was mesmerized by the gifts of the Spirit. And please make no mistake about it. I believe in all of the signs, and I believe in all of the gifts. Yo, if I ever get sick and there is not a doctor nearby who can give me a prescription, there is no surgery for what is in my body, please do not go knock on the door of the pastor who says, all of the gifts of the Bible have ceased and have stayed there in the Bible. Do not go and knock on the door of the pastor who says, you better just suffer in silence and you will get your reward in heaven. Please go and find you a Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, spirit-filled believer who would declare, I still believe the whole Bible. I still believe that the deaf ears can be opened up. I still believe blinded eyes can be open. I still believe that dead can be resurrected in Christ. Is there anybody in this house who still believes the whole Bible that your God can work miracles? Come on, somebody give him praise. Go find that guy. Go find him. Go find the creepy Christian. Go find that guy to pray for me. Get all the oil in your house. Anoint me from the top of my head to the soles of my, I'll bathe in the oil. Just want to set the record straight. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe in the power of God. However, I believe in this collection. I I just want to try to help give you a broader picture of faith. I want to try to help give you another set of words that might help you on this journey. Because here's what I believe. I believe that many times, if we only have one set of words, what we do is we turn our faith into an event. And because we turn our faith into an event, it makes us miss out on the daily common miracles happening all around us. Faith is not a moment. Faith is a lifestyle that you give yourself to. Like life is full of miracles. I just, I just want to stop for a moment because some of us, we're missing it. And what takes place in our life is that we become familiar with things that we see and it's familiarity that diminishes and decreases our faith. All of life 
is one big epic saga. There is miracles taking place all around you. Your body, bro, is a miracle. Like, dude, we're still figuring out the human body. The psalmist said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And every atheist scientist would have to stop and say, amen, that's true. Because the DNA in your body alone is, is loaded with more code than we could ever begin to analyze. You want to be shocked? You want to find a phenomenon? You've been looking for a sign? You've been looking for a wonder? Just study the human eye and get ready. You're going to have to step back and do a praise dance and a Jericho march because it is radical stuff. This earth we're walking on, holy smokes, it is a cosmic conundrum. Like, whoa, what is this place? Scientists are still figuring out what holds it all together. How did it come about? The very fact that the sun rose again this morning is nothing short of epic. It is miraculous. It is wondrous. It is awesome. But what happens is that it's just common to us. And it's our familiarity that will steal our awe. So a lot of us, we think faith is the thing we need for the church conference. Faith is not the thing you need for the church conference. Faith is the thing you need for your everyday, ho-hum, common, average kind of day. Faith for me, I just want to give you another set of words, is this whole other place. Faith for me is the thing that gives me strength to carry out patience. You realize that patience is not the ability to wait. Like one way or another, you're going to wait, bro. Patience isn't the ability to wait. Patience is how you wait. This is why you can find a person who's following Jesus. And although they are believing God for big things, and although they are waiting on God for breakthrough, and although they have seen God do things in the supernatural, yet they have not received them yet in the natural. Although they don't have it yet, they can be walking in a valley and still maintain peace. They can be midst of a crisis, but they haven't lost their purpose. It's because they have faith to be patient. It's faith to value small. It's faith to recognize that I grow slow. It's faith to understand that the seemingly insignificant small stuff that's taking place in my life, it is packed with more potential than you could ever imagine. What is it called? It's called small faith. Someone say small faith. See, many of the big things that God does are on the heels of the small things that we do. I've preached for many years now, and let me just say it again, and I'll preach it to you again next year. We serve a slow, fast God. It's important, especially in our 6 p.m. turn up. Uh, I don't know what we're calling this anymore. What is this called? Savage service. <laughs> the 6 p.m. savage service, where we go savage. That's got a nice ring to it. I like the alliteration, six savage service. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's important that like in this robust, young, faith-filled, excited group of people that we understand that we serve a slow, fast God. I don't know how to say it, but following Jesus is slow. You ever see Zootopia? <laughs> My son was in the 10 a.m. service. He's like, Dad, yeah, amen. I was like, yeah, okay, son. That's the only point he got. Um, there's that sloth who's like, he's just so slow. I'm telling you, following Jesus is like, read my Bible, pray, worship again. It's like really freaking slow. It just is. It's like, oh, we're, like, we're going to church again? Yeah. Wait, wait, like conference is back? Yeah. Like serve some more? Slow. But then all of a sudden, it's really fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because it's those that pursue God patiently that get to witness God move suddenly. I wonder if we could raise up a generation of people who would say, God, I will follow you as slow as you go, trusting that at just the right time, you will move immediately and breakthrough will take place. It's not the size of your faith that counts. It's the size of your God that counts. And I'm going to try to hammer this into your heart all night tonight. And here's the big thesis I am working with. God can do something big with something very, very small. 
I didn't come tonight to preach to you about great faith. I haven't come to you to preach to you about epic faith. We haven't come to boast in our strong faith. We've come tonight to appeal to our congregation and to our community, what would happen if we could walk out of this room and have small faith? Someone say small faith. We have been studying Mark. We've been in the first three chapters. I felt like this past Sunday, Manushka Charles and Dakota Duran, they just, come on, I need us to put our hands together and give honor where honor is due. What a, if we can do a little bit better than that, can we thank God for the pastors and the leaders? Just amazing. What that, what's that one line that I like Manu about? You can like say it, like I said it to her today. Help me at the, you can find, you network to find, you network to find a career. Hold on, you network to find your career. You, you withdraw, you said it better than how I said it this morning. Okay, you network to find your career. You withdraw to find your calling. Good night, we'll see you next week online. That's how good that was last week. We, we, we've been studying the gospel of Mark. In the first three chapters of Mark, um, Jesus has been in action. In fact, this gospel known as Mark, it separates itself from Matthew, Luke, and John in that theologians would call it Jesus in action. We don't get baby Jesus. We don't get Jesus in puberty. You just get full grown, full beard, Jesus doing miracles right in the first chapter. But as you study it, it's not just about what Jesus is saying. In fact, as you read Mark, it's even more important to pay attention to what he is doing. And so since January, we've been watching what he is doing, but now we get here to Mark chapter four, and all of a sudden, as you open up to Mark chapter four, Jesus is starting a brand new collection. He's in a series of sermons. He's giving four parables that we could take months and months to break down because they are so rich in content. The first parable he tells is the parable of the sower. I love this parable. It's about a farmer who goes out, scatters seed, and some seed falls on good ground and other falls on bad ground. Some falls on some rocky ground and birds take it and weeds steal it. The whole premise and the point of the parable that Jesus is teaching is Jesus is talking about as the word goes forth, what type of life is it landing on? What is the soil of your heart? Is your heart good ground? because it's not enough to hear the word. There's a difference between hearing the word and receiving the word. You could be here tonight because someone coerced you to come and say, yeah, you gotta come to my church. It's at a zoo. It's awesome. I promise you, we'll probably get to see a lion. I can't promise it, but I'm hoping we can. There's some monkeys for sure. Just come. So you're here and you're like listening, but just because you're hearing what I'm saying doesn't mean that you're receiving what I'm saying. It's only that when we receive it with the right heart, does something begin to blossom? Does something begin to flourish? But Jesus pivots to his second parable. These are short stories that he's teaching secrets of the kingdom of God. And the second parable is the parable of the lamp on the stand. And the whole point of this parable is all about shining bright for Jesus. But what Jesus will say over and over again, something like four or five times, he uses the word hear. Because what he wants you to realize is the way that you hear the gospel will determine how you share the gospel. You ever been in a church before and some guy's up there preaching and the whole time he's preaching good stuff, but the way he's presenting it is like, I don't know, bro. I'm telling you, God loves you. You're like, I don't, I don't believe you, man. That's scary what you're saying. It's because the way in which we heard it, the way in which we interpret it will determine how we share it. And Jesus is saying, I want you to get this loud and clear. I love you and I am for you and you are called to burn bright for me. This is not a season for the church to be apathetic. This is not a season for the church to be ashamed. This is not a season that we would live in the darkness. This is not a season that we would be quiet. Oh, but this is a season that the church of Jesus Christ would shine bright with the gospel. He tells a third parable. The third parable is the parable of the growing seed. The growing seed, I like it because now he's breaking down what the seed is. The seed is God's word and God's word is potent and powerful. And when God's word lands on the right soil, it does not matter what happens on this earth. It is only a matter of time before that seed begins to blossom. It does not matter if you are in the daylight or if you are in nighttime, that seed is at work. Anybody thankful that even while you sleep and even while you rest, there is a God in heaven who is working on your behalf. His word does not return void. But then he gets to his fourth parable. His fourth parable, which is just two verses, which I'm gonna draw your attention to tonight, is known as the parable of the mustard seed. Mark chapter four, verse 30. Again, Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? 
or, or what parable shall we use to describe it? So just imagine when we stop, Jesus is like, all right, I want to try to teach you about my kingdom. Um, I want to try to establish how your God works and how he operates. And so I'm trying to think of some words. I'm trying to think of a story that I could tell you to describe it. I'm concerned that you've only got one set of words. You've only got one type of description. How many know the way you describe something indicates what you believe about it? And notice Jesus, he's gonna describe the kingdom of God. He's not gonna say the kingdom of God is epic. The kingdom of God is suddenly moving. He's not gonna sound like I know what you did last summer trailer movie style, okay? Instead, he's like, let me try to describe, let me try to give you a set of words. Let me try to give you a picture. Verse 31, it is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and it becomes the largest of all garden plants. With such big branches, the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So Jesus is teaching about his kingdom. Remember, this is why Jesus came. He came to establish his kingdom on the earth. How do we establish his kingdom on the earth? The only way we can do it is through faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. When we pray the Lord's prayer, what are we praying? Father, your will, not my will. We're praying heaven down to earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Understand that the church of Jesus Christ is the embassy of God on this earth. You and I are citizens of another kingdom. I'm thankful that you're proud to be an American. Yet what I'm scared about is there's some Americans that are more proud of their country than they are the kingdom of God. It's fine to be proud of your nation. I just hope you match that with double pride when it comes to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and this kingdom you're a part of. I want to teach you about my kingdom, and my kingdom, if I could describe it to you, is not this big, massive thing. Instead, it starts in this small format and it starts in this little size. It's called seed. And if you want to establish the kingdom of God, which is why we're gathering, which is why we're serving, which is why we're giving, which is why we had I Love My City, which is why we're getting baptized, you didn't come here tonight to hear another motivational speech. If you did, you should have stayed home. TED Talk is way better than us. But if you came to be a part of the kingdom of God, if you came to establish something on this earth that is yet to exist, if you came to walk different, if you came to talk different, if you came to think different, if you came to be different, oh, I got news for you. You have come to the right place. I have come to serve notice that God's kingdom is being established all over the world today. Well, how do you do it, Jesus? And Jesus would say, well, you need faith. Well, how much faith? The size of a mustard seed. Well, what does that mean? Just small faith. Someone say small faith. small faith. That's important that we take a moment. We're just all in introduction sermons. So in the coming weeks, we're going to look at different stories in Mark where you're going to see men and women who did something small in faith and then God did something big on the other side. Why? Because I want you, as you begin to study over the next few weeks, you at your job, you in your marriage, you with your dream, you tend to think, man, these people in the Bible, they just had this epic, awesome faith. And it's not true. They were just like you and just like me. They had small faith and then God does something big. Someone say, what I got is a whole lot. But it's important on week one that we actually define what faith actually is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one gives us that answer. The writer of Hebrews, we do not know who the author is, but we do know that the writer of Hebrews is writing about the fulfillment of Jesus from the old covenant, that all of the prophecies, that all of the law, that all of the old way of doing things, Jesus has fulfilled it. I say that because as you read all 13 chapters, I believe Manu knows the answer to that, 13 chapters of Hebrews, they're all about the name of Jesus. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, gives us a definition of faith. They say, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So let's talk about faith for a moment. What is faith? As I wanna say it because 
I keep qualifying myself week after week. I am not a hater. Um, <laughs> I'm not. Like, I, I love you. And if you're here tonight and you don't believe, oh my goodness, we love you. I'm not a hater, but I'm going to try to tell the truth. And it might come off like I'm hating. Um, faith is not um, good vibes. Dang it. Dang it. Dang it. He's doing this tonight. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought he was going to be kind. Um, it, uh, faith is not like, you know, positivity. And by the way, I, if it's going to be negativity or positivity, I'm going with positivity. But, but, but that's not faith. Faith is not just like, yeah, name it and claim it and confess it. Like, you know, people are like, oh my goodness, I just love Vu, man, the vibe, the vibe, the vibe. Such a vibe there, bro. And like, I, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know. Like, the best is yet to come. I love that. It's like my motto for my life, bro. I just got that tattooed on my back. The best is yet to come. Yeah. It's, it, it, the best is yet to come. You're, yes. Um. <laughs> Unless you're operating outside of God's will. So it's, it's not a vibe. Like, I think there's a lot of people today that are like, oh my goodness, yeah, I just got, I have faith, man. I have faith. I don't know what these voices are tonight, but I'm just, you know. <laughs> I have faith. I have faith. Like, I'm a person of faith. You a person of faith? I'm a person of faith. You faith? Faith. And like, you ever get in a conversation like, I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Like, I'm, yeah, yeah, I just agree. Amen, you know? But what a lot of people are walking around with in 2021 is what I would call faith in faith. So just because you say the best is yet to come doesn't mean the best is yet to come. There's a lot of people that just have, their faith is actually attached to faith. It's faith in faith. And so we think the more I have faith, the more my faith will come up. It's, it's not true. It's a misconception because it's not about the size of your faith over and over again, I'm going to say. The size of your faith does not determine the outcome of your faith. It's only the object of your faith that does that. Let me try to teach this for a second. Um, it's like if, if Jesus, a.k.a. Jesus on the front row, um, <laughs> if he gives me his chair and his chair is broken, it's only got three legs on it, and we sit it up here, and I am now get you guys and say, all right, I'm now going to sit on the three-legged chair and it will hold me up. It does not matter how much faith I have in the three-legged chair. We could do Jericho marches. I can go to my dad's old office and pull out his shafar and blow it till I'm blue in the face. The chair's broken, bro. No, but I have faith. No, it, it's broken. In the same way, I could put a life preserver on and jump in a pool and say, I have so much faith in the life preserver. That's great, but it's not your faith that's holding you up. It's the object of the life preserver that's strong enough to hold you up. I don't know if you're, oh. I just think we think like, oh, it's like, you know, the quality, of, it's not the quality of your faith. It's the object of your faith. Put it this way. What is your faith attached to? My brother-in-law, D, he's somewhere around here. He bought me this 70-inch TV last week. It's awesome. I, I just, thank you, Lord. I just, I just prayed for it and it happened. Um, <laughs> he bought me this big old TV, and we put it in, this, in my office in my house. And to be honest with you, I don't know how to hang TVs. Um, I'm not good at building stuff. I just <clears throat> I pray for stuff. And so uh, I, I hired this handyman, really great guy. He's awesome. He like, wears a tool belt all the time. And I think they know his name at Home Depot. I'm not jealous, but a little bit. And so uh, he came over, and he he put the TV up and I got one of those really cool, have you seen these like stands that you can like pivot the TV and awesome, I'm into that stuff. And so, we, you know, I walked in there, there's a TV and so I, I left and he, he called me, this is Monday. He's like, Rich, I wanna let you know the, um, I, I set the TV up. I said, this is awesome, great. He goes, check it out. Oh, cool. So I came into the room, this is Monday. And like, I'm one of these, I don't know, like I'm into details. Like you ever see people put the TV up, like all the wires are out the back, you know, like that, that, ain't, that ain't it, you know? And so, it was like, it was perfect. It was all detailed. The plaster was on the wall. It looked so good. The way the TV was positioned and set up. I was like, this is great, man. And so I just went over. This is true. I just went over and <laughs> I, did, I, I, I hardly even touched it. I just adjusted it because it's got a movable stand. I was just, 
tweaked it. I sit down. I'm telling you, within 10 seconds, this thing suddenly falls off the wall, crashes on the ground, and shatters. Have you ever happened, have you ever had something happen like so quickly that when it happened, like your, your initial response was to repent? I was like, I don't even know. Like, what, I don't know what I've done. Sins of omission, God, I don't know. You know my heart. I do not, I was repenting. I was like, it's crash. I'm like, oh, sweet. I, I go into tongues. I'm like, that quick. I'm like, wow. I'm like, what in the world? I call this handyman. I said, bro, it hasn't even been 12 hours. He said, what'd you do? I said, I do nothing, man. I said, come back over. You're supposed to be the best. And so he came back over and he opens up my wall. And would you believe that when he opens up my wall, he, he discovers that the way that room was built, it wasn't up to code. That all the sheetrock that was on the wall was three inches off of every stud. And so when he had marked the stud, he thought he was on it, but unbeknownst to him, when he was drilling into the sheetrock, the, the, the screw was still three inches away from the stud in the house. It's so amazing to me because it appeared to look so good. Like it, it looked so sharp and it was so finished and it appeared to be the right thing. But all of a sudden, one little touch from the outside began to expose exactly what was holding that thing up. I felt like preaching to someone tonight. You can show up to church and you can appear to have it all put together. But I am telling you what, one touch from this world, if you are not attached to Jesus, that thing's going to come crumbling down. It will collapse. It will break. Suddenly it will be over. But I got some good news for the people in the back. If you just got a little bit of faith and if you drill yourself into the person of Jesus, if you attach yourself to this gospel, there is nothing that happens on this earth that can can take you out. Somebody give God a shout of praise. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You've got to attach yourself to something bigger than yourself. When I say the best is yet to come, I am quoting Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what I hope for, certain of what I do not see. This is not some declaration that, God, I need a million dollars in my bank account. God, I want a bigger car. And I walk outside, and there it is. That don't make any sense. This verse is about Jesus. I know this. I know right now I can't see Jesus, but my hope is certain in him. I know right now I got some problems around me, but I am drilled into the person of who he is. My faith is not in faith. I declare the best is yet to come because one way or another, I will spend eternity with my maker. Somebody give God some praise. Come on and give him praise tonight all over this house. Now faith is being sure of what I hope for Jesus. Certain of what I cannot see. I'm certain of everything that he said. It is true even when I can't see it. I don't have time to brag to you about my great faith. I don't have great faith. I just got a little bit of slow, suddenly I trust him and it happens. It's called small faith. It's, it's, it's small faith. I just, we just don't want to build a community that looks really good. But one touch from this world. Whew. Isn't it amazing how many people are missing these days? Isn't it amazing how many people have just drifted in a 12 month period? Is it because Jesus changed? Is it because Jesus is weak? Or is it because maybe we were attaching our faith to something? other than him. God can do something big with something very small. Someone say small faith. I want to show you quickly, and I've not done anything quickly tonight. I apologize. Thank you. I love you. You're coming to my house tonight. No, I'm kidding. Like, it's really weird. Sorry. It's probably inappropriate too. Sorry. 
I want to show you just three things that small faith does, all from the text, just two verses. I know there's a lot of talking and not a whole lot of um, extracting, but I, um, I'm going to try to do that quickly in the next 15 to 20 minutes if you'll, if you'll give me that opportunity. Three things small faith does. No, number one, small faith sees in the seed. Small faith sees in the seed. And so I want you to try to understand this for a moment, that... Um, just because I can't see something doesn't mean that I can't believe in it. Like, especially for all of our friends, this is your first time into a zoo church. Um, <laughs> I've never seen God, but I firmly, wholeheartedly believe in God. I believe in him. Well, you can't believe in God. You've never seen him. Oh, okay. Do you believe in the wind? Uh, why? Uh, because I felt it. Okay. Because I've experienced it. Because I've witnessed its power. How, how many know living in South Florida? We've all testified to the power of the wind. We've experienced the wind. Never seen it, but I believe in it. We had a small group in my house on, on Monday night. A lot of things happened for me this past Monday. Um, <laughs> and I love, our, I love our small groups. This week we had um, close to 200 VU crews meet, almost 2,000 people in VU crews this week. Can we thank God for what he's doing? I'm not just trying to do my life in big church. I'm trying to do my life in a, in a small group with real people that know my name, know what's going on in my life. Don't just look at my talents and my gifts, but actually know about my weaknesses and my tendencies and my issues. We're working our faith out together. And the way that we do crews at VU Church is that we do a discussion based upon whatever sermon we heard that week. And so, of course, this past Monday, we were discussing the message that Manushka and Dakota brought last week, which was just amazing from Mark 3 on calling. I loved it. And so we had a great discussion. But the way that you get that discussion is our team puts together a great guide every week, uh, vuchurch.com slash crew. And you can read along and see how the questions go. And so we had some new people at our house that night, and somebody asked for the Wi-Fi password. Of course, I, you know, I gave them the Wi-Fi password. It is funny because when you give away the Wi-Fi password, if you're anything like me, like anyone else like me, like you have one password for everything in your life. It's like, as I give you my wife, I'm also giving you my son's inheritance. There it is. It's like, you know a lot about me at that point. So I, I gave these guys the Wi-Fi and then they were having trouble getting connected to the internet. In fact, it was taking a few minutes that we had to stop and pause and we all had to kind of come around it and, and wait for them to get connected. What was interesting to me or what's interesting to me every time when there's a lag with someone getting onto the internet is I've never heard someone say, that's it. I'm done with Wi-Fi. I don't believe in it any longer. It has just disappointed me far too many times. I waited longer than I wanted to wait. It did not happen as quick as I hoped it would. And so therefore I do not believe in it and I am done with it. In fact, I'm burned out on Wi-Fi. I've never heard someone say that. In fact, I've seen the opposite. What do you do? You just keep on trying and trying and trying until you get connected. See, faith is like Wi-Fi. You can't see it, but it has the power to connect you to what it is that you need. But if I'm being honest with you, I think there's people in church that got more faith in Wi-Fi than they do Jesus. Because if you really had faith in Jesus, even though you can't see him always, how many of you know that you would just keep on trying and trying and trying? I know he might not have showed up on your timeline. I know you might feel like you've waited far too long. I know you might have been disappointed in the past, but friends, I want to encourage you tonight that waiting on God is not a waste of time, but rather waiting on God is the greatest thing that you could ever do because on the other side of your waiting is a breakthrough that only comes when you continue to try to get connected. These disciples, they come to Jesus another time in Matthew 17 and they can't cast out these demons and they're frustrated about it. Oh my goodness, why can't we do what you did, Lord? It's amazing to us. You're able to do all this stuff. You are God in the flesh. I don't know why we can't do what you can do. Crazy, but Lord, what's the deal? We can't cast out these demons. And Jesus, he responds to them and he says, because you have so little faith. 
He says, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When you study a mustard seed, what you find out is that a mustard seed is about one to two millimeters in size. Meaning if it was in my hand right now, from where you're seated, most of you would not be able to see it. In fact, if you were gonna look at it from a metaphor standpoint, you could almost say the mustard seed is invisible. But faith is the ability to see into the seed. Faith is looking at that which appears to be invisible and continuing to try, continuing to pray, continuing to believe. When Jesus corrects the disciples and says, you have such little faith, he is not giving them a literal size of their faith. Instead, he is speaking in expression. And what he is saying is, he's saying, if you had faith that was invisible, you could actually move mountains. He's not saying that they have little faith or small faith. He's saying you have no faith. You got no faith. You don't believe. You haven't prayed. You're not attached to me. And you're wondering why you can't do what I can do. If you had invisible faith, if you had faith so little attached to me, there is not a mountain, there is no obstacle that would prevent you from moving forward. You could continue to progress in me. I wonder what you see in the seat of your children tonight. What do you see in the seat of your spouse? What do you see in the seat of your job? Seeing the seed of your calling, the seed of your purpose. I just felt like tonight there's people that walked into this place that you're giving up on dreams that God spoke to you loud and clear. And I just felt like part of my assignment tonight was for you to look back at that dream. And although it's invisible tonight, and although it is little right now, if you would begin to see in the seed, if you would begin to look into the invisible, there is a God who declares that which is invisible today can all of a sudden begin to manifest tomorrow. Don't give up. Keep trying to get connected. Someone say, see in the seed. But faith doesn't just see in the seed. Small faith also works in the dirt. How many know that that seed without soil is kind of pointless? Seed's potential is only revealed once it's planted in the dirt. You actually have to put the seed in the dirt and the dirt actually has to do its work in order for it to grow, in order for it to blossom, in order for it to flourish. Seed needs dirt and faith works in the dirt. Jesus says, my kingdom is like a small mustard seed. A mustard seed is one to two millimeters, practically invisible. But watch what happens in Mark chapter four, verse 31. Mark chapter four, verse 31 says this, it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it becomes the largest of all garden plants. What we know about the mustard seed is that it goes into the ground and then it has the potential to become 30 feet large, 30 feet in width. That's how big this plant can become from something invisible. Did you notice the key word in verse 32? Yet when planted, No doubt, I want to be very, very clear. Your life is small, yet when planted. Your talents, I just, I know, not super encouraging. Really small, yet when planted. Your gifts, small, yet when planted. Your dream, it's honestly a really small dream. You think it's really big. Oh my goodness, this big. It's pretty small, yet when planted. Your resources, small. Yet when planted, let me holler at someone in the back. Your bank account, small. Yet when planted, yet when planted, what does that mean? That means when I release that which God has given me and I surrender it over for his glory and for his name's sake, he can take that which is invisible and when I plant it, it can become large, it can grow, it can become something more than what it is today. Somebody give God some praise. Yet when planted, Yet when planted, in the same way the seed has potential, the dirt has a purpose. The dirt in your life has purpose. Yet when planted. I grew up in church, and so I know all the Christianese and all the language. Oh my goodness, I just wonder, is he planted? Are you planted, brother? You know what you need to do? You need to be planted. I'll tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you're not planted. 
Have you ever stopped to ask yourself a question? What does it feel like to be freaking planted? Everyone's always talking about planted in church. Okay, cool. What's it feel like? What's it all about? Let me tell you what it feels like. It feels like dirt. I grew up in church. And so, you know, all these agriculture metaphors, I've grown up in the city. I don't understand all this. I'm like, I'm not a farmer, you know, but everything, Jesus is always talking about farming. I'm like, what is all this farming stuff? I've just often wondered if the seed could speak, what would the seed say it feels like to be planted? Seed, yo, what's it feel like to be planted? Does it feel good? She's like, no. Hey, <laughs> seed, is it comfortable? No, it's not comfortable. It's a seed. It's a seed. It's a seed. If the seed could speak, because what you got is a lot. Some of you are bypassing that which God has called you to do. And some of you have derailed your destiny and you continue to walk in disobedience. And some of you tonight, he's calling you back to put your faith in him. I just want to let you know if the seed could speak, he would say it feels like dirt. Well, what's the dirt feel like, Mr. Seed? Is it fun down there? No, no. Feels like a hole has been dug and I have laid my life down. I have surrendered all that I am and I have put myself into the ground. But is, is it comfortable in that ground? It's not comfortable. No, 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 because the dirt, it comes on top of me and the dirt weighs so much more than me. You ever just feel like life is just weighing on you? Oh, I thought I would have graduated from this now. I thought I would have figured this out. I thought I would have discovered how to do this. I thought I would have had to manage all this responsibility, but it never ever feels that way. It just always feels like dirt weighing down on me. It just feels like more pressure. It feels like more responsibility. Dirt could mean so many different things in your life tonight. It could be the pain in your life that you're avoiding. So many people trying to escape from their pain. We're praying the wrong prayer. God, take away my pain. But many times God's saying, no, 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 no. I need to let the dirt do the work because in the same way that your life has potential, the dirt has a purpose. Your mistakes have not disqualified you and your weaknesses have not rendered you useless. Rather, this is just dirt and all of it has a purpose and it does not feel comfortable to be planted. Some of you tonight, you're in this place, you're like, unless I get a word from God, I'm done with this church thing, I'm done with this Jesus thing. And some of you walked in here saying, I, I just need to find some comfort. I just need to find some peace. I just need to find some rest. And I just wanna to submit to you tonight that maybe all of that discomfort and maybe all of that dissatisfaction is not an indication that you're outside of God's will, but maybe Maybe it's the very fact that in this life, you might feel buried oftentimes, but you're not buried. You are planted like a seed in the ground, and it is just a matter of time, if you let the dirt do the work, that something's gonna grow, and something's gonna get bigger, and something's gonna blossom, and something's gonna flourish. I know it was invisible yesterday, but it's about to grow! It's about to grow. It's about to grow. Let the dirt do the work. Let it work in your life. I want to stop praying this prayer, God, take away the pain, take away the pressure, take away, I just, God, make me stronger in it. You're not buried. You, you, you just planted. I was talking to my therapist last week. Yeah, I go to therapy. <laughs> so should you. <laughs> You know, like, you know, you, you, you find an outlet so you don't have an outburst and you do the work. And I think sometimes people think like, oh, I'm gonna go, you know, talk to this person or I'm gonna go do this practice and I'm gonna have a breakthrough. But, but more often than not, it's, it, it's not how it works. It's something like, you know, therapy, it's just, you're doing the work, you're doing the work, you're doing the work, you're doing the work. And all of a sudden there's like, whoa, there's a, there's, a, there's a slow, fast component. It's like going to the gym. I don't go to the gym like, where's my abs? Like, you, you gotta keep going. You just do the work. And we were chatting and um, it was just one of those 
kind of insight moments that just the Lord spoke to me and there was like an aha. It might not be an aha for you. It was just an aha for me. And we were chatting. I was explaining to her that there has been moments throughout this last 12 months where it's not that I was doing the wrong thing. In fact, in many cases, it's I was doing the right thing. I was doing the right habit. I was doing the right practice, but it's like I just didn't feel maybe how I used to feel when I did it. Is this ever... You ever done the right thing, but you feel the wrong way? You ever come to a worship service? You're like, I know I'm supposed to worship, but I don't feel nothing. Maybe you're sitting in a message and you used to feel so much of God's presence when his word was opened up, but tonight here it is, the word is opened up and you're here. You're not going anywhere. You're not quitting. You're not giving up, but you just feel nothing. You used to go to your crew and it used to just be so life-giving. Now you're just going through the motions and you're not giving up and you're not quitting but you just don't feel the right thing even though you're doing the right thing. I was just expressing that the season has been an odd one. You know, I love the fact that we can take church online. I met a girl yesterday at I Love My City uh, who is, goes to our church and she lives in Atlanta. And she actually flew in town, if you can believe it, because she wanted to serve with her crew at I Love My City. I'm, I'm so grateful for technology and all the ways that God's opening up the world to us but I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I miss this. And not just this, I just miss all of it. I miss seeing people. I miss, I miss seeing people's faces when God's moving in their life. I, I, I miss witnessing the stories right after being in God's presence. I, I, I miss watching people become the leader they've been called to become like right there in my proximity. They just, I, I miss it at times. This is, this is what I'm about the local church. I like I like the real community of people. And we were chatting and she said, Rich, I don't know if you know this, but you're, you're an extrovert. And I was like, how much am I paying you again? I knew that. Um, I'm sorry. She said, uh, you draw energy from the human spirit. That by default, it's not that you are doing ministry to be thanked. It's not that you're doing leadership to be noticed, but unbeknownst to you all these years, or maybe you did know, you've been drawing off of other people's energy. And so there's no wonder that in this season where there's been so much cut off from one another that you would feel at times dissatisfied or you would feel unfulfilled because you're missing something that's been coming your way for many, many years. She said something. She said, Rich, I wonder... I wonder if this could be a season that if you would reframe the obstacle that's in front of you, I wonder if you could draw a line in the sand once and for all at 36 years of age, that as you move forward from this point on leading and communicating, I wonder if you could make a decision in your heart that in this season, I will discover once and for all who I'm doing my ministry for. Is it for the applause of people or is it for the audience of one? And it's like something got reframed inside of me. And that is, is that there feels like to be a whole lot of dirt being in ministry at times, leading and teaching. But I started to think to myself, if I could be so energized by the human spirit, I mean, the human spirit's powerful. Once again, you might've come in here tonight and you are a doubter or a critic. You're not into church. You're definitely not into Jesus, but you're like, yo, I'm sensing something in this room. It's called the human spirit. There's something powerful that happens when like-minded people come together with a collective purpose and pursuit to grow, to become, to be better. You can sense it. It's tangible. It's the human spirit. I could tell you story after story about the human spirit defying odds and stepping up and doing radical things because the human spirit is powerful. But friends, if the human spirit Spirit can motivate us. How much more when the Holy Spirit becomes your motivator? How much more when the Holy Spirit begins to sustain you? Faith works in the dirt. Works in the dirt. And I'm not praying, God, take away the dirt. I'm praying, God, let the dirt work. Faith sees in the seed. Faith works in the dirt, but lastly, tonight as we close, faith rejoices in the harvest. Dirt will either help you or hurt you. It's either pushing you towards Jesus tonight or pulling you away. 
lost so many people in this past season because the pain was too great and it pushed and pulled them away from Jesus. Let your storm always push you to where Jesus is. It's not a question of whether or not you're gonna be in a storm. The question is the question's always gonna be, is Jesus in your boat? I want Jesus to walk with me through every trial, through every adversity. I need Jesus today more than I've ever needed him. You can make progress or you can make excuses. Can't make both. Can't make both. I'm either moving forward or I'm staying here. And I'm done with staying here. I'm going to progress. But as I progress, I understand there is no such thing as a nonstop harvest. Why? Because harvest is not an occasion. Harvest is an occasion. It's, it's not a station. It's a season, not a destination. But you can't always be on the top. You can't always have an A in every category. I just want to bring some peace to some people tonight because there's some people that are like, you're just beating yourself up all the time. Harvest is not a nonstop thing. It's a season, not a destination. Some of you, you're listening to the message right now and the whole time while I'm preaching, all you've got your eyes on is the harvest. And that's awesome. You're going to have a harvest. But listen, you don't travel to harvest. Harvest comes to you. Oh, I sense this word in my spirit. You, you, don't, you don't go chasing a harvest. A harvest is a result. A harvest is a consequence. A harvest is, watch this, a harvest is just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. I don't go looking for it. I don't go chasing it down. I do my part. I plant. I sow. I see in the seed. I work in the dirt. And it's about time. That a harvest comes about. You don't go chasing it. It comes right to you. It is a result. It is a consequence. It is not some place that you live in. It is a season that you pass through. Don't judge your day by your harvest. Measure it by your investment. I could tell you story after story about the harvest that God has done at Vu Church in five years, but I don't want to take time all the while just telling you about those moments. I'd rather get us all excited about the investment we made yesterday when 300 people showed up into Liberty City and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to paint a parking lot. I'm going to stripe it. I'm going to put white lines down. Ain't nobody going to know my name. Ain't nobody going to notice what we're doing, but I'm making an investment. I'd rather celebrate 2,000 some people showing up to a small group to say, I'm going to work my faith out in discussion. I know it doesn't look great and it doesn't look epic today. It's just small and it's just gradual, but little by little I am growing and little by little I am pursuing Jesus and it's just a matter of time before harvest comes my way. Because harvest is coming. So, someone say harvest is coming. It's just a matter of time. It's, ju it's just a matter of time. And when it comes, there is only one response, and that is to rejoice. Watch what Jesus says, Mark chapter 4, verse 32. We are done tonight. If you want the short version of sermons, you should come at 10 a.m. If you want the long-winded version, no filter attached, there ain't no other program. I'm not going to see you again for another month, so let me get it all in in one night. Here it is. Yet when planted, it grows, and it becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. This invisible seed, one to two millimeters in size, grows to a 30 foot long plant. How big is this plant? Jesus gives what it seems to be a random detail. He says this plant is so large that its branches stretch out and birds can come by and find shade under the plant. I don't think anything that Jesus says is random. I think it's all done by divine purpose. So we don't, we don't pray God bless us so that we can be blessed. We pray, God, bless us that we might be a blessing to those around us. Isn't it odd? Birds come and perch on its branches under its shade. These are some random birds. These birds weren't there with the seed. These birds never got down in the dirt. But these birds are reaping from the blessing of the plant. See, I'm not praying that I, God make Vu Church large and in charge. I'm praying, God, make us so large that every random bird in this city who has never planted in this house, who has never gotten down in the dirt, might come and find the shade that only you can provide. 
Whoever you are, wherever you come from, you are welcome in this house. I heard someone say to me the other day, yo, I don't like Voo Church because it's a mega church. I said, you are wrong. We are not a mega church. We happen to be a little church with a mega vision. And this mega vision is not for our glory, but it is for the glory of God and the gospel that we might build a house so large that as the branches stretch out, that every person who is burned out on religion, every person who is thirsty for something real, every person who has desired a real touch from God, every person who is dry in their soul, they might show up and they might find the shade of this gospel, the shade of His grace, the shade of His mercy. Whoever you are, you are welcome in this house. We built this place with you in mind. Doesn't matter if it's your first day at Voo Church. Doesn't matter if you ever served on a team. Doesn't matter if you ever prayed. Doesn't matter if you've ever given a dime. Everything we have done, we have done that God might grow us, that you might come and find shade for your soul. This is why we exist. What a picture of the kingdom. My kingdom is like a small mustard seed that when it gets down in the dirt, it begins to grow and blossom. And it blossoms so big that the branches are so wide that random birds who did nothing could come and reap from its harvest. This is why we rejoice. This is why we give our God praise. This is why we thank God for all that he's done in five years. It is not for our glory, it is for His, and it's so that others who are far from God might come close and rest in His shade. And it's not because of great faith. No, we would not be so arrogant to claim that. It's because of small faith. attached to Jesus. And we started the year with one of the greatest miracles, external miracles we've ever seen as a church. We were given uh, a building in Design District that we closed on at the end of January. Um, we paid $3.6 million. Uh, this church that started an apartment in five weeks' time gave $2.5 million cash. But I got up here that next Sunday and just say, I just don't think God's done. And I just want to teach you because as I'm saying things like that, it's not like I'm feeling this great boldness. I'm not like, ah. Oh. I don't wake up, ah. Oh. Oftentimes I wake up going, yo, I don't know what we're doing. But I'm going to keep following Jesus. And I declare that there was more miracles to come. And tonight is a great night of rejoicing. Tonight is a great night of celebrating. Tonight is a great night that we, we celebrate all that God has done in the last five years, but we're celebrating what he's going to do over the course of the next five years because we're not trying to grow overnight. Like a mustard seed, we're going to grow over time. And I wanted to show you what I think is the second greatest miracle that's happened in Voo Church's history, and it happened just this past week. Check out the screen.
Hey, so if you, um, if you haven't noticed yet, this is, uh, we just put this whole entire property, seven acres uh, under contract last week. This is gonna be the South Miami home for VU Church, ladies and gentlemen. God's done two massive miracles over the last two to three months. And both of those miracles, we didn't initiate. And both of those miracles, there wasn't even a door that we could see in the natural to walk through. And I wanna see God establish something in Miami that He's never established before. And so as we walk around this property, let, let's look around and let's go, God, okay, you've given us this canvas, the sky is the limit. And we'll trust your timing as it all comes to fruition. Are you with me? I'm so grateful for this moment. Look at the we have our own big space. Seriously, God is so good. Like he literally like just always exceeds our expectations. Yeah. Like who would have thought, like I'm just thinking back before we even launched and we were struggling trying to find a location. A couple weeks ago, the Lord really gave me a word. I think it'll encourage you, but I really felt the Lord spoke to me and said, Rich, this is a, a piece of the problem, not the whole problem. I'm solving a piece of the problem. Trust me as I solve a piece of the problem and as I solve one piece, it's gonna give you peace. And I just felt like I just took that. And I, I wanna encourage some of you guys right now that God doesn't always solve the whole problem overnight. He solves pieces of the problem over time and each piece that he solves, he gives you a little bit more peace. I just have even more peace that God's working uh, in us. He's working in our church that the best days for Vu are not behind her, but in front of her. We're gonna see the best really is yet to come. We're gonna see greater things take place. We're gonna see this city, I really believe, turned upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Food Church, South Miami. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Tonight is night that we rejoice. Tonight's a night that we celebrate. We just put seven acres in South Miami under contract. We're believing that we're gonna close on March 19th, and that's gonna be the first brick and mortar location that Voo Church has ever had in its history. There's a whole lot to say about this. Of course, we'll be talking about it as the weeks to come. We got work to do. Some of you are like, yo, I live in Edgewater. What about my church? Don't worry, we're not leaving the city, but we are gonna do something we believe great in South Miami. It was December of 2019 that we spoke out that we would launch a church and we just didn't know it was gonna take us all that time later, a year and a half. I think spring 2021, we're gonna be seeing Voo Church in South Miami taking place. And God's timing is always the best timing. And I said in that little video right there, this doesn't solve all of our problems. It's a piece of our problem. You better already know your boy's drawing up stuff down there. We're gonna look back one day and say, how did that become this? How are we gonna get there? We're not gonna get there because of your epic faith and we're not gonna get there because you're so strong and I'm so strong and because you're so great and because I'm so great. But instead we are gonna be reminded that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came into this earth like a mustard seed, born in Bethlehem, seemed insignificant, seemed small, raised in a carpenter's home, but nobody knew that he was growing and he was flourishing, that he was God's son in the flesh. And then one day they put him on a tree and they put him into a tomb and the tomb, it looked like it was a hole in the ground and as the rock went over top of him it seemed like the seed of his life was over and done with but how many know that three days later that seed on the inside of that tomb it could not be contained but rather three days later the god of all the heavens and the universe conquered death hell and the grave and the scripture says the same power that conquered death that conquered hell that conquered the grave oh baby it lives inside of you and it lives inside of me and so tonight i might be weary and tonight I might be tired, but I got a feeling if I'll raise my faith to where he is, there is a God who says, I can use your weakness. I can use your issues. I wonder, is there any people in the house who got some small faith tonight? Come on, lift your hands. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, sing it out. Come on, come on. 